Um, so, Freddie James, I'm on the fund management business at Tritax. Uh, Tritax is a UK-based investment manager of several investment vehicles, two of which are listed and have a uh, primary focus on the industrial and logistics market. Um, in 2013, we listed the Tritax Big Box REIT, um, which on the London Stock Exchange, uh, which is an investment vehicle that focuses solely on the UK big box logistics market. And that has grown um, to comprise circa 60 assets uh, with an average size of 500,000 square feet across the UK. Um, and that's a, a gross asset value of about 4 billion. Um, so that's been, that's been a success for Tritax. And I'm off the back of that success. <coughs> Last year, in July 2018, we launched Eurobox uh, with a view to following a very similar sort of pattern of investments, um, but in continental Europe only. Um, and we have so far raised approximately 460 million of equity um, on, the, on the market. It's another it's a listed vehicle, um, IPO in July. Um, we have debt on that fund, our debt facility. And so far we've invested in 10 assets in five countries in continental Europe. Um, only one in this region, um, in Poland, um, in Strykov, just north of Łódź in central Poland. Um, but the aspiration for that fund is to grow it into a large-scale investment vehicle, which is uh, very much income-focused, uh, low-risk, uh, core approach, and, and income-focused. Um, so we are a new investor into this region, so it's a bit of a newcomer's view, um, but we hope to become a sort of bigger investor in the, the the coming years. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Dorota Wysokińska Kuzra. I'm representing Colliers International. I'm heading the uh, corporate finance division in the CE. Um, what we um, do in the corporate finance is helping with all financial needs of the clients, so starting with the classical ones, debt financing and mezzanine financing. But what we focus more is all kind of equity solutions for our clients including joint venture, including platform transactions, M&A, and hopefully in the future also some good um, IPO of real uh, estate companies in the region. We've been involved and um, advised Kajima in entering the Polish market on the platform deal, acquiring the operational business from Oaktree in Sun Housing, which was actually the first investment transaction in this region, in this asset class, and a um, few other platform deals we are doing. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, CMS, CMS Carol McKenna Nabarro Oldsmark is a global law firm which has a very strong presence in CE. We've been present in CE for 30 years now. Uh, we have offices in almost in every CE country and very strong real estate team that we've been doing real estate team deals in the, in, in the region for many years. We continue to lead in the legal market in CE. Well, that's, that's us. Great, Stuart. Good morning, my name is Stuart Beatty. Um, I joined the management team of Skanska Commercial Development Europe last year, and my background is that of a occupier. So I spent 18 years in the US and European markets um, running the portfolios of various banks. Um, Skanska is well known as one of the top 10 global construction companies. <coughs> they also uh, self fund. Uh, and develop uh, office projects in 20 markets uh, globally, four in the US, six in the Nordics, 10 in Central Europe. That equates to, at mid-year, about 42 projects or 1.1 million square meters uh, of new office space. Great, thank you. Um, let's, I mean, lots of points that we can pick up also in, um, in Kevin's presentation there. Um, let's just start around that sort of broader macro political environment. Um, I suppose, um, from your point of view, Roger, how, how do you see, I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting in the region, um, so how do you see this influencing um, the CE markets when you're looking at, at the economy where you've got high growth and in many other areas of, of Europe? How do you see that influencing things? I think that growth is driving the, the, the property market to develop. It's, it's, it's obviously uh, the people, uh, if people have jobs, if people have if the salaries increase, uh, then obviously they can spend money and they can, they can 
um, uh, that the property market will grow. Uh, I think that the, 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 uh, the key fundamentals are, are will in long term will be most important in the sense that if the region continues to grow, if the region continues to develop, then obviously uh, there will be more demand for real estate, logistics, uh, even even retail is booming in some of our countries, which is which is quite surprising to, to many Western investors. The retail centers are full of people and are are booming and are still are quite an interesting investment product. So I think this is this is the this is the, the, the trend. Okay, good. Uh, and and just from your point of view, Freddie, I mean, how do you see uh, the attractiveness of these markets? You're obviously you, you said there you're. You're a kind of first mover into this region in a way, and from your point of view, you're particularly looking to grow in the region. What makes it more attractive from your point of view? Is that to do with the macro environment, or is it specifically a, a logistics argument for you? Um, a bit of both, uh, really. Um, I mean, from Eurovox's point of view, we are strategies to have a pan European fund, uh, well diversified, and certainly CE has a, a big logistics market. It's, it's fair to say it's focused mainly, mainly in Poland. Um, I think Poland is the ninth largest um, market by, by square meters. It's got sort of, uh, I think a market of 16,000 um, square meters. Um, I think after that you have Czech, which has a market of about 8,000, sorry, 8 million square meters versus 16 million square meters in Poland. So they're, they're large markets, I think, compared to the rest of Europe, Poland is probably ninth in that, in that order. Um, so from our point of view, it is, it is important to have exposure to those markets, but it's fair to say that we will probably focus mainly in Poland, and Czech, perhaps Slovakia. Um, and those markets are, I mean, really, we, when we look at a market like Poland, we're looking at um, quality of the real estate that we can buy there and, and the quality of covenants. And, and, and actually, if you look at um, if you look at this from a, an occupier's, occupier's point of view, um, there's some really good fundamentals for occupiers in Poland. There's um, low occupation costs, um, there is low labour costs, and flexible labour, and then you are on, you're in a, in a geographical location that has access to some great markets, um, a strong domestic market, but also on the doorstep of Germany, which is. Um, you know, the fourth largest economy in the world, um, and another very strong markets across Western and Central Europe. So occupiers, for occupiers it makes a lot of sense to be there in many ways. Um, and from our point of view, we uh, can gain access to a uh, some now established logistics market, uh, which has good quality logistics buildings, good quality tenants. Um, I mentioned the building in Strykov, just north of Wood, that we invested in, um, so end of last year, beginning of this year, that is let for ten years to Castorama, who are part of the Kingfisher Group, who are a UK-based um, PLC, um, and that that is one of two buildings that Castorama, Castorama have in that location, and they serve the whole of their domestic market, which, uh, which is mainly uh, sort of seventy to eighty retail outlets from from those locations. Uh, but from our perspective, we've got a, a brand new building there, hundred thousand square meters, uh, great. Covenant um, and um, you know, serving a good domestic market. Um, so those are some some, some key themes. Um, and then, from a, a value point of view, from our funds, there's no doubt that there's there's a bit more value in a market like Poland, yield-wise, compared to uh, neighbouring markets like Germany um, or other areas in, in Western Europe. Um, so so those are some of our, our key thoughts. And uh, sorry, the other. You know, the main driver and the main sort of theme of our investment strategy in Europe is is the expected growth in e-commerce. So you know, we, we uh, came in touch on it before. The um, uh, the e-commerce penetration of the retail market in Poland is probably around five percent of total sales. That's something that we expect to grow sort of significantly over the years, and um, and that is a key driver in um, kind of tenant demand for for warehousing space. So we want to be in that market with a, with a good market share of the uh, warehousing store. Interesting. I mean, I also did a session at uh, the CE Summit last week in Warsaw, um, one which was particularly around the logistics side and, and e-commerce. And the appetite there, they really, you know, 
whereas in the UK you're used to kind of ideas of 20, moving up to 25%, um, they also seem quite certain for the Polish market at least that it was also part of a high growth that would get them towards that kind of 20% um, in that time, which was really interesting, I think, if you compare that with Germany, for example. Um, I just wanted to pick up with you, Stuart, because you, you've obviously um, come from a, from a long history with sort of the occupier side, um, and then moved into, into Skanska. I mean, Freddie there mentioned that the, uh, you know, it, was, it was positive from the occupational side. Um, how do you see that? How do you see the markets in terms of their attractiveness from an occupation side? And, and, and I suppose, has that led to any sort of discussion about the types of buildings and the types of investments that you're making and the locations of them? Thanks, Richard. Um, so, 2006, um, I started a project uh, to support location analysis looking at um, where to deploy um, staff from a high cost location. And like many organizations, um, still growing revenues, but margin pressures are growing all the time. Uh, if you were able to tell your global CEO you can save a billion dollars from the operating costs, uh, they're going to sit up and pay attention. Um, now, clearly, there's a global labor arbitrage to be taken by moving from a high cost to a low cost location. Um, and, and in financial services, typically it's around a 60% delta. Um, but it's other things on top. So whilst you'll look at the price and availability of the talent, you'll look at the political and economic situation, um, it's also this mindset, which I think is incredibly important. Um, and as highlighted in this recent um, investment report, a lot of these Central Eastern European cities are outperforming in terms of growth, are performing in terms of the connectivity, and investment in the connectivity infrastructure, but also in the human talent. And the percentage of employees with tertiary education is equal to many of the Western cities. So really you're seeing cities competing against each other, um, and clearly a huge growth in Central Europe. So from an Occupy perspective, it's a very attractive proposition to remap processes, and not just and team extension, but actually over time, the talent which is deployed um, further east to a lower cost location is evolving to actually run and support that service. So it's actually a role deployment. Um, and that's what's creating the significant savings in the operational cost for large organizations. And you can see, um, and Kim mentioned the numbers of over 300,000 in Poland alone. And Poland is third now after China and India for that BPO market. It's grown tremendously quickly. And it's also diversified the economy. So it is much more of a service economy than a pure manufacturing economy. And that diversification, I think, is also helping support the growth today. In terms of the office space and how that supports the occupier, it's clearly important. Back in 2006, um, many of the regional markets had close to zero modern office stock. Um, I wandered around towns and I would end up taking a, a floor in a, in a shopping center and converting it to an office because there was no suitable product. Um, it's an enormous change. Many of these markets have grown from very little office stock. Um, and the footprint requirements of many of the international tenants have grown significantly. So whilst 10 years ago, uh, many corporations may have a few hundred, employees based in countries like Poland, that's now up to three to 5,000. So it's been a tremendous growth in their own footprint requirements. And I think the, the office has helped be a differentiator for many organizations and supported their ability to attract and retain talent, which is, which is key. Um, and just in case there's anybody there who isn't familiar with those office markets, and particularly with the BPO office market, maybe just explain a little bit about what you mean by BPO. So BPO is a, a general term for business process outsourcing. Um, and it's a slightly generic term because each corporation uh, will study uh, the, uh, the markets and then they will move and create either a center of excellence, a, a shared service center. And the different labels really attribute to the type of roles and the type of support, whether it's a team extension, 
and it's supporting you in the preparation of your Excel or your presentation, or whether actually they're delivering a service from that center and supporting a global organization. So they're at different stages, and over time, what started off as grow your own talent from university has clearly evolved, and you can now go into many of these markets and recruit 100 lawyers or people to support governance or know your client, or there's a lot of different skill sets which are supporting quite complex tasks being undertaken in those regions. Okay, good. Um, I've got some great questions that have come in, so thank you for those. And I'll deal with a couple of those. Um, and you can decide, Dorothy, whether this is for you or you want to hand it over to Kevin. That's up to you. Um, but we've got a couple here that are both on uh, retail, actually. Um, one of which is, do you think retail at sea is oversold and in which markets? Um, and then there was another one, which was the, the view on CE retail was surprisingly positive. Will the structural change impact seen in the UK and other um, EU markets also impact CE towns and cities? Do you want to tackle that, or do you want to pass that? Yeah, maybe I start. And then You're going to pass it, okay? No, no, I start. Oh, sorry, I start. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think what we see uh, in all C countries is um, that the retail performance numbers are very robust. And um, this is connected with the spending power uh, and uh, rising consumption since 18 years already and in all countries. And I would say in uh, more CE, um, SEE countries, it, um, the trend is even bigger than in CE countries. So um, from the operational numbers, those asset classes are really doing very well. I think there is no investor sentiment, as all of you here know, because I, I bet if I ask who of you is looking at retail nowadays, some of you will not even like to hear the questions. And this is generally our experience when we ask clients and investors about retail. Um, but from the operation numbers, um, looks good because of the spending power, because of the rising consumptions. Also, all the, or many of the political, especially in Poland, but also in other C countries, uh, governmental programs, social programs, they are in fact helping retail nowadays, or boosting retails. Those famous um, social programs in Poland with those 500 plus uh, slots plus per eight kids, or um, this is really going into mainly retail. Obviously, retail will be affected uh, by the changes in the global world, basically with um, changing of the consumer um, spending in a sense of what they want to buy with the sharing economy. People not necessarily want to have, they want to experience things. On the other hand, if uh, this is a real change, if you, are, as, if you are a cyclist, you would like to have on your own five or six great uh, bicycles and you buy it and you spend thousands of money on it. Yeah? So this is really more connected with a kind of shift in, um, in what you buy and how you spend. But what I see, um, the owners are seeing it as well and they are adopting to those changes. So I really think this is a kind of opportunity also to invest in tourism nowadays. I think the only uh, only retail which is really suffering are those uh, big box food market like um, I mean this is not a secret or Sean's Tesco's and all the bigger's they are really going into smaller formats because what counts is convenience. Um, but generally, this is my view on retail. Uh, yeah, the difference between the region um, and um, and Western Europe is that. Um, it, so sort of during during communism, you know, they, they were basically the re retail was a, a city center building with sort of, sort of nondescript shops. You know, they basically said clothes, shoes, uh, and other things. And, and obviously, um, there was no real high street. So you know, very few of the markets really. I mean, there's a very tiny high street in Warsaw, quite a strong high street in um, in Prague and Budapest, but, but again, literally lim limited to one to two streets. Which was quite, which is quite uh, a contrast to, to a lot of Western European cities. So you know, whilst whilst there was a big decline in the high street markets here in Western Europe, um, you know, even even climate wise, you know, you don't really want to go shopping on the high street in Warsaw in, in you know minus twenty degrees. Um, so you know, so a lot of the, a lot uh, so they're very very shopping centre uh, uh, based. A lot of these markets, um, usually you know, there's some some very good developers out there. Uh, ECE, Rodamco, Clepier. So they know what they're doing. They know what they're delivering. Uh, some of those are, you know, are now being sort of uh, modernised. 
and certainly the tenor mixes are are being developed uh, to for form for modern uh, occupier uh, sorry mod, modern uh, consumer behavior so um, you know there is there will of course be losers there will be centers that are either badly badly located uh, were, were sort of badly constructed um, you know that's 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 uh, Fairly, fairly clear. But you know, dominant centres with good tenor mixes, those that, that invest and reinvest into what, what, what modern shoppers want, uh, will, will remain, and that's uh, quite quite straightforward. The other one um, is really that um, retail parks are quite strong because they're relatively simple to do, relatively simple to maintain, um, and um, you know, if you want to run an e-commerce uh, sort of uh, operation out of the back of those, it's also quite straightforward. And investors are really sort of uh, Liking those, and uh, a number of cities where where that's uh, also they're also popping up. So, okay, great, thank you. Um, th there's a, a couple of questions also coming on office, and I'll deal with those now if I, I can as well. Um, so this is for whoever wants to pick it up, but Stuart, this might fall into your category a bit. Um, do you fear oversupply in the office space in Warsaw in 2020, 2021, um, when some of the biggest office towers are due to complete, especially as demand is slowing down? question. Um, <clears throat> we've also got one which, which we can pick up afterwards as well, which is what percentage of flexible office space is considered healthy in a building, and there's a big growth in flexible office space as well, particularly in, in Poland, but in other areas of, of the CE. Um, um, I think the same question could have been asked a year ago in 2018. I think people have in the past doubted the growth. Um, clearly, if you simply looked at the stock of Warsaw, and you saw a number going from three to four million, four million to five million, five million to six million, you're going to question whether the demand exists absorbs uh, 10, 15, sometimes more percent of that stock being introduced. Um, the answer has been that the demand exists, and I think that was proved last year. Um, and I think you probably need to look at it in context. Um, clearly, Many of these cities are underdeveloped. Um, and if you look at the proportion of space per person, per inhabitant, they remain at very low levels. So in Central and Eastern Europe, it's close to a meter uh, per person. Um, and certainly even in Warsaw, it's only probably about 1.6. Compare that to some of the German cities, which will be around five. You could say there's a long way to go. You've also got obsolescence in some of the older stock. So clearly, when you see a large local institution looking to move, it's a substantial footprint, and they're coming from fairly dilapidated buildings, which will be torn down. So it's not as if some of the old stock is going to be recycled back into the market. Um, so I think at the moment, uh, you could actually point to a current shortage over the next six months of space in Warsaw, um, and clearly there's more stock to come online in 2020. Um, but I think even looking out to 2021, if we do see 20% additional stock in Warsaw, uh, and that's equivalent to what we saw in 18, and that was taken up a strong, strong appetite. Um, clearly, at some point, uh, it will come down to the basics of demographics. I think uh, from the occupier perspective, the appetite to grow is there. Um, and Warsaw came into the BPO market much later than the regional cities, um, partly because of the pricing differential, and it was easier to actually establish and have that first sense of, uh, you know, market sort of uh, advantage by coming into a smaller city and dominating. Warsaw is only just starting to come into its own, and as a location, um, the FT wrote, I think a couple of years ago, after. Um, I, I had committed to Warsaw myself in a previous role that actually the future of the back office for the city of London was likely to be Warsaw and the future of the back office for New York was likely to be Jacksonville. So it's, it is only recently coming onto the market in terms of its uh, role in the back office service provision uh, for international corporate. So I believe the growth is there. Okay, good. Dorothy, you should pick that up. Yeah, may, maybe maybe just that I f fully agree, and um, I think Warsaw especially is the let's say biggest producer of students, which are future labor, and uh, I think um, one of the driving factors or challenges generally for uh, for our for the Polish market, but not not only Polish market, as also Kevin described in the presentation, is labor, 
and in the sense, Warsaw is the biggest producer of um, students. They, uh, they are 250,000 um, students uh, annually, which is basically most of them are going into the labor market after the studies. So this is just one comment about Warsaw, just as complementary arguments, and just some kind of information from our, let's say, um, office leasing departments in Warsaw. Basically what my colleagues see is that the companies from the finance industry, so banks, um, insurance companies, etc., they are analyzing um, more now what they really need, how much space they need, how, uh, and they are a bit of more cautious. On the other hand, uh, we see a lot of more interest from the IT companies. So, um, of course, there will be a kind of what we observe, a kind of shift from the industries, but not really from the general interest towards office space in, in Warsaw. And one of the criticisms that, used to, that I used to hear a lot from investors was, yes, 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 great, but the developers then develop a big new shiny tower, and then they tempt everybody from the other shiny tower, and everybody moves across, and that leaves a big, yesterday's big shiny tower then empty. Um, but that seems to have gone, certainly from the Warsaw market, at, at the moment anyway. Um, and, and in fact, there's a trend, one of the questions came in, which was, where are we with mixed use? And uh, a lot of the projects, when we did the property tour, um, we were seeing the large office, but also then seeing a lot of new mixed use and sort of changing old areas um, and repositioning those where there were historical buildings within them. Um, which I think is an interesting new development as well. It's, it's indeed a new trend, not only in Warsaw, but I think generally in CE and also worldwide, creating places, creating destinations, because also, and I'm personally very happy that we do not have any longer office clusters, residential clusters, or I don't know, retail clusters, because where do you want to live? You want to have a close way to your office, you would like to have a nice apartment somewhere or a house and uh, all the convenience and shops uh, also somewhere around. So I think this is a general, generally an, uh, a trend in, in urban development um, to create places, destinations and mixed-use projects where you have all the functions. Uh, assuming obviously you know how to do it uh, to make it also um, attractive for the investor because eventually you're not building it for yourself, you just want to sell it. Good. Um, I'm going to deal with a couple of things here which, are, which have come in which I'm going to largely put around the risk side of things. Um, so maybe we can just pick, pick these up. Um, one of which is given current liberal tendencies, so you can decide whether you agree with the, with the premise of the question. Uh, given current liberal tendencies in some of the CE markets, uh, to what extent is transparency for international players being challenged? Um, what effect will the EU punishments really have? Will they affect any economy or sub-market? Or are they just EU Commission grandstanding uh, is one. And uh, is Eastern Europe still struggling with the effects of collectivizations? Are property rights regularly disputed? And that will obviously vary from, from one country to another. But maybe if we whoever wants to can pick up some of those. And also let's put in any other risks that you're particularly seeing um, in terms of challenges to the market and whether you agree with some of, the, some of those risks that Kevin had in his slide. And maybe a couple of words about the political trends and the situation. Well, if you look at, if you look at uh, CE, it's probably, it's an issue in the sense that the, the, the countries are, the, the, I'll say, Political systems are be, are evolving, are changing, but isn't it the risk everywhere else? Well, if I looked at Boris Johnson suspending the parliament and being challenged in court just a couple of weeks ago, then I see it's 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 not a it's not a uh, it's not just CE. It's just the whole world. It's it's probably there is a lot of happening at the moment. So I think it is a challenge. You have to you have to take it into consideration. I think the yields are already taking into consideration. It's not it's not uh, the UK. It's 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 Poland. It's Czech Republic. It's Slovakia. It's 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 different. But uh, what we are also uh, seeing, I believe, is that uh, the economies and the countries are adapting to the new situation and also also the so the situation is, is, is a challenge it's 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 not only in Poland it's not only in CE but it's everywhere but it's also where we're adapting to it we have to we have to will it live with it and somehow in four years that in Poland we've had an 
illiberal, non-liberal liberal government we've, we survived, we've seen tremendous growth. And also one more, one more, uh, uh, what I've noticed recently is that in Poland in particular, the trend is like four years ago when we had a new government, we would see a lot of laws that were uh, restricting the economic uh, uh, development and restricting the business activity like the agricultural land reform that, 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 that created difficulties on not only to acquire agricultural land but generally to acquire land in Poland. Now we're seeing an, a reverse trend. We're seeing some new laws that are helping the, the businesses to develop. Uh, even even or, or or are correcting the mistakes that were made initially. So whether it's a long-lasting trend, I don't know. In Poland, we have a new, we have the same government. Although it's a new government, it's the same government. Whether the, the trend started some time ago, uh, the trend of reversing some of the some of the uh, laws that created difficulties. So I do sincerely hope it's a trend. We we that that it will it will it will create it will create. Uh, better environment for development. But look, if you look at the number of buildings that were developed in Warsaw in recent four years, uh, would they develop in an unfriendly environment? It's just impossible. I mean, it's, 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 this building are being built, and it's not only Warsaw, it's the whole country, it's not only office, it's logistics everywhere. And maybe to answer the, the, the so that, 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 that's how I see it. It's, it's maybe to answer the question about the titles is probably more relevant from a legal perspective. I think the number of uh, disputes about title in uh, in CE and in Poland in particular is, is has always been very low. It's true we did have uh, uh, issues of former owners challenging the titles in Warsaw, but if you look at the actual number of uh, uh, negative decisions for for any investor it's it's you can count them on one on one hand you no know, it's, it's 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 a couple of cases very specific particular cases but generally the title system the, the the way titles are recorded has been very stable and if you have an issue you can always go to a title insurance company and insure and the fact is that they in my experience in probably 99 cases out of 100 they did insure and it shows whether what what the risks are for a very reasonable premium so i, I would not believe that uh, there are any title issues in, in our, our region at the moment thank you good. just picking up some of those risks things for when you're when you're looking at um, where you're moving in the region um, how big a part does that risk element play uh, political risk does that put you off hungary for example um, in comparison to poland H how do you see that yeah i mean those those are certainly factors that we consider that, you know, we look at political risk. I mean, we're, at the moment we're keeping it relatively simple, we're a relatively new business, so we are focusing on um, Poland and Czech particularly. Um, I mean, and we, we look at Poland, we, you know, we know that there are big investment volumes there, we can see that there are numerous uh, international developers developing logistics there, um, so we're in good company there. Um, there's lots of international capital, so you know, the market is um, established and, and, and a large market. So we, the flip side, we wouldn't want to be investing in a um, in a market that is smaller, has less international capital. Has. I mean, I, I think um, you know we, we we take advice from um, lawyers, solicitors, people who, who know, know the market well, and so we're slightly guided by that. But at the moment, um, Poland certainly seems to be reasonably politically stable. Um, uh, just had the election, um, the Law and Justice Party are back in, and, um, and they've overseen a lot of growth over the last sort of four plus years. Um, so we, we, you know, we we, we kind of keep an eye on that. But um, we're we're confident that, that Poland, particularly, is a, is a good market to be in for the foreseeable future. Um, and points like um, the, the title matters. I mean, um, I think in logistics, a lot of logistics property is built on. Uh, which recently built and it's built on, on farmland which um, has lesser sort of title issues than, than sort of um, land that's previously been developed and owned for, for sort of years and years um, in Warsaw by, by, by different parties over the course of time. So things like that we're, we're relatively comfortable on. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit of an overview from, from our perspective. And, and there's just one coming on um, on Germany, and anybody else can also pick that. But from your point of view, obviously, a lot of logistics um, is based around the German border for service in Germany. Traditionally, if Germany um, catches a cold, CE markets sneeze. Um, so, is that a concern for you? Is that a, do you see that as a risk, the sort of slowdown in Germany that we? We saw basically from, from Kevin's slide as, as well a low growth environment for the next three to four years. And anybody else as well on that? I think if you look at the fundamentals of Central Europe today, as we saw on the slides earlier from Kevin, on the one side you've got GDP growth, which is largely not just double the neighbors in Western Europe, but actually forecast to remain at that level over the next year or two. In part, that's supported by consumer spending, which is also growing. Um, the importance of rising wages shouldn't be underestimated. We see the struggles in the US and even our own country. Um, having a growing economy with growing wages is going to support and protect, I would suggest, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, clearly, there are some dependencies in manufacturing, especially on automobiles. Um, but I would suggest, actually, the economies are increasingly more diversified, increasingly more representative in uh, the service sector, and I think that will, will help. Okay, good. Um, a couple of things, um, one of which is, has got the most likes, so I am going to ask it, <laughs> which is, and you, you may be a different way of answering it, you may want to answer that afterwards, possibly, um, but who are the best local asset managers for real estate investors looking to partner with someone in CE. I suspect you can't say that, uh, but you can say, I suppose, what people are generally looking for and then maybe answer that afterwards <laughs> to whoever has asked that question. Uh, but in terms of asset managers, typically what are people looking for um, and, and what sort of expertise do you need in the region? Okay, maybe I pick on it. Um, we have different investment fund managers and asset, asset managers in CE. Generally, I would say that this is connected to the maturity of the market. So the, 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 the more mature the market is, the confident in the local um, companies is bigger from the investor side. And especially if we look at the CE, um, Poland as the most, let's say, mature market last year, upgraded by the FTSE Russell to the developed countries alongside with UK, US, Germany, France, etc. There are a lot of you know, good companies doing both asset management and investment management and investing uh, in uh, managing funds of different investors. So I think there is a lot of opportunities here um, just to team up with um, local players who have just a lot of experience. On the other hand, if we go further down, if you look at countries like uh, Romania, uh, which is, by the way, a great country to invest, uh, especially for opportunistic investors. Um, then there are a few players, but probably most of the investors would like more like to establish their own presence, um, hiring people, etc. So I would think, I would say that this is really connected with the maturity of the market and with the certainty to, to, for the investor that the local um, guys can really manage the operations for them. Okay, good. Um, I, I want to pick up a question also from Derek, thank you Derek, um, which, which picks up on that, that idea of particularly urban town centre mixed use trends. Um, are we going to see residential with logistics, with student, with retail, with hotels? Um, is, is that something that we're expecting to see, and, and I guess office as well, are we expecting to see that, are we seeing it at the moment? We see it and we expect to see. This is generally a trend in the world. The trend is the now to combine um, maybe not necessarily residential with office, but uh, having residential close you know, to the office. Uh, this is what we see. This is, by the way, a kind of resurrection of the famous Mokotov era in Warsaw. A few years back, nobody wanted to buy an uh, office building in Warsaw, or who had the office building in, in the Mokotov area called Mordor was really suffering. Now it's changing because of a lot of residential activities uh, going on there. 
including the first, you know, a change of the M Park office park, which uh, was put on sale and sold to Eco Investment, who would like to now to convert it into residential. So this is happening. Also, in in line with the trends, we will see much more um, projects which will combine residential with uh, residential for rent with the PRS, uh, with micro living, also a kind of mixture with the student housing. Also, as a trend which is still not in in the CE, but it will come. We see it already in, uh, let's say, uh, Western countries and in the US. It's a combination of senior living with student housing. And this is also connected with the demographics, really, where the where the society is getting elder, and um, the families are not so strong nowadays, unfortunately. On the other hand, the younger can really learn a lot from the elder, and the other way around with the technology, the elder can learn a lot from the younger. And this is the trend we see uh, that, um, especially in the resi market, they are pro combined projects developed and uh, delivered to the market, combining exactly senior with students and with micro-living. Also, what's the difference between um, micro-living, uh, apart hotel and hotel? Yeah, to some extent, if you like, from the broader perspective, it's exactly the same. It, obviously, each hotel brand is saying it's unique and each, you know, um, uh, micro-living operator saying it's create a great uh, sharing economy, whatever. But at the end of the same, it's the same. It's creating a place where you would like to spend um, a nice time when you are traveling abroad or where you have a three months project or you would like to move your own family or whatever, just to have you know more community inside. So I think this is a general trend in the world, and I think from the investor side, uh, the investors will adopt to it because it's pretty easy to say we are investors who are buying 30% uh, office, we have 30% office allocation, 20% retail, and the rest, whatever. And I think the investors are understanding it. A lot of investors already raised funds for um, everything which is not office, not retail, or not logistics, so for this kind of mixture. So I, I think absolutely this will be the trend, or okay. is already. Okay, good. Um, I know I've just looked at the clock and we're getting closer to the end of our time, so I'm going to go for some kind of quick fire ones. Um, there's been a question also, and it was one, uh, a topic that I wanted to pick up. Um, in terms of the other, we've talked a lot here about Poland, um, but in terms of other areas that are potentially interesting that may or may not have higher returns, um, Skanska, I know you've been building in other areas as, as well as Poland. Um, how do you see those other markets in comparison to Poland, higher returns, and, and also um, is there the same amount of interest from investors when you come to, to sell in, in different countries? I think clearly Poland, and it's seen in the stats, uh, dominates. It's 50% of that market from a capital markets perspective. Um, clearly it's also the only market which has the regional cities. Um, which is obviously closer to, to Germany in some respects. Um, we are um, committed to um, Prague, which has always been a very strong market, and clearly supply constraints will limit how much product you can deliver. Um, I think Buda, Budapest is, is very exciting. Uh, we've got a strong pipeline there, and also in, in Bucharest. I think Bucharest is probably one of the um, most uh, under rated in terms of its opportunity. Um, it's clear if you saw from some of the graphs, um, it hasn't caught back up with the trend, um, and we'll probably see uh, an outperformance, I'm sure, in, in, in the yields over the next year. Okay, great. Um, a quick question that came in as well, um, which was in terms of um, what are typical lease terms and incentives for second-hand offices in CE? Does anybody want to pick up that, typical lease terms? Or is that a coffee question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, lease terms generally for the region are, uh, are five years. Again, they can be more flexible. Uh, obviously, flex space will, will, is, is designed to offer sort of more flexible lease, but that tends to be in more, uh, more, more newer space. But, but typically, five, uh, typically five years is a, is, is a common period. Um, flexible uh, uh, in terms of tenant incentives, I mean, 
typically for a typical or standard lease, you're looking at sort of somewhere between um, 15 to 20%. Those are reducing at the moment. So for uh, second-hand space, they can be a bit more, depending on how long that space has been um, empty. So you could creep up to maybe up to 25% in some cases. But in general, because vacancy is so low across most markets, you know, those, those tenant incentives um, are, are decreasing. Okay, good. Um, there's also one on capital. Uh, capital <coughs> targeting the region seems relatively low, uh, which is interesting because obviously for the Poland market, the, the international capital is, is really dominant. Um, so maybe let's just, just pick up the little point about um, targeting. So what are investors looking for in the region capital coming in? Um, interesting that you mentioned uh, the deal that you were working on there with, and that was Japanese capital coming into student housing in regional Poland. Uh, but uh, just anybody in terms of the capital flows, the appetite for that, and also where that extends to. Okay. <laughs> I, I think, as Kevin said, what we have in C is the capital from all, 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 all that the world. I think as a new trend, we see more domestic capital, especially from Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia. And this is, uh, this is, I would say, really a new trend. And I think this is a kind of competition from the usual sources from, let's say, UK or US. Why this? Because those companies, let's say the recent you know, announcement of Wink uh, entering into Wink, a Hungarian you know, uh, development and investment company, entering uh, Polish market with the acquisition of Eco Investment, the biggest Polish developer. And um, I think this is a really competition from, uh, for UK and US based companies because those guys will always, the regional guys will always put a better price because they are less afraid because the risk assessment will be probably more moderate, if you like. I'm not saying they are crazy, I'm just saying they, they are already investing since um, 15, 20 years in their own countries, which has similar problems as CE, and they have, let's say, um, the risk appetite is just bigger, so they are entering the different markets. Um, look also, if we take the 2018 number, 60% of the trades or the investment volumes in especially Czech Republic and Hungary was done by domestic capital, 20% uh, in, in Slovakia. So these are numbers which shows you not that there is no interest you know, from, from, the, from the other part of the world. It shows you that the domestic capital is very attractive, despite Poland. We do not have in Poland domestic capital. Um, we do not have uh, any regulation which would allow the pension funds to invest into, in, into the capital. So uh, in Poland, the activity is coming only from international uh, investors, international capital, from all over the world. So we have US, UK, South Africa, uh, all the Asian money, including, for example, Philippines money, which I think it's uh, the only place where they, they are now invested in, in CEM and probably a few other countries which are um, looking, uh, including Middle East, who, Middle East, who is now looking to invest on also, you know, in this kind of region. On the other hand, I would say that despite the lack of domestic capital, which, which is really a pity that we cannot um, really um, buy in our own country in a, let's say, institutional way, I think on the other hand it creates opportunity because once we have the RIC legislation or other legislation which will allow the pension funds to invest directly into real estate, this creates even more liquidity. Always, liquidity is the key for any investor to invest in any market. I mean, the, you cannot say the Polish market is not illiquid, but if we add one day in the future, also the domestic capital, this creates even more liquidity. So, I think the region looks uh, really attractive, and um, I think generally the region looks attractive for different type of investor because we have a huge and pretty developed market in Poland. We have uh, Romania, which is now, uh, I would today buy in Romania, being an investor really, uh, you can buy for 7% um, a brand new office building in Romania, where the development yields in Warsaw are probably around 8%, yeah? so, and you're not you are not taking any development risk. Some of the investors are looking also at Serbia, being close to enter the European Union. So I think generally the CE and SEE region creates opportunities for all the investors universe, depending on their appetite and return expectations. Just, just the last thing, um, in terms of, we always ask this, which is if you had to invest on behalf of these good people, where would you invest? What, 
what do you think are the most interesting opportunities at the moment in the CE market? Freddie. Um, I've spoken a lot about Poland, and that is where we have our, our one asset, and so I'm at risk of being a bit of a one-trick pony. I, I think I think central Poland, and particularly the Łódź region, is quite an interesting region. It's at the crossroads of Poland and the crossroads of Europe. And But, but the other sort of interesting thing is the, uh, the rail link to China that comes into Łódź, which is part of the um, sort of uh, Belt and Road Initiative with China. And um, <clears throat> there's, there's a rail service there that um, takes, I think, 14 days to, to get to China, which is so half the time compared to shipping, which I think takes 28 days from the, from the same location. And I think that, you know, that that's, um, there's a growing number of trains that go in and out of there. I think um, there's 10 rail movements a week, which has increased a lot over the last sort of two or three years. And I just think that that's probably got um, a lot more to kind of come from that particular bit of infrastructure. Um, so yeah, we're pro Poland and pro that area of, of central Poland. Okay, great. You've already given us a sneak preview. Yeah, I already said that being, especially being opportunistic investor, I would go to Romania nowadays. Um, one hand, on the other hand, uh, I would uh, invest into alternative asset classes in Poland, basically student housing and resi for rent. I think this is also a kind of. Uh, very good and seems to be pretty safe investment uh, nowadays and with a good perspective. Okay, uh, I've invested in spring in uh, for a small small scale in a student housing uh, in, in, in Poland, a secondary city, I achieved 9.5% return on it and it looks like a very steady income stream. So if I, if I had more money, I would invest in student accommodation again. Okay, good. I'm also going to back uh, Dorata and um, go for prime offices in uh, Bucharest. Prime offices in Bucharest. Okay. That's a very quick answer, but I know that's because you've got claims to catch. <laughs> 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 um, good.